Today we are very fortunate to have Cheryl Dorsey with us from Echoing Green. Um, she is also in the process right now of volunteering with the Office of Social Innovation that the Obama administration is uh, putting together. So perhaps you can ask her a few questions about that. Um, I, again, I've said to her that I have offered or opened up to all of you the opportunity to off ask any and all questions of her. I also gave her the right to refuse to answer if she so, so chooses, but she said no, she's pretty much open to anything you want to ask. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to turn the floor over to Cheryl. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks David. Thanks uh, for having me here. Uh, I'm uh, always happy to come talk to uh, students and folks who are interested in social entrepreneurship. Um, David said we have until 2.30 and I saw from your list of questions there's some really good ones in there. So I think I'm going to really literally try to talk for 10 or 15 minutes and then let's just open it up for a conversation because I think that'll be much more interesting um, for me certainly and hopefully for you as well. Um, so how many people have heard of Equine Green? Show of hands. Okay, so some of you. Okay, so let me give you a, sort of the uh, quick and dirty overview of Echoing Green. So Echoing Green um, is a global social venture fund that provides seed capital and technical support to some of the world's best emerging social entrepreneurs. So essentially we're angel investors in the social sector. So young people like yourselves, passionate, um, committed social change agents with innovative, good ideas for social change come to us and they look for um, first funding. So we like to be first funders in, and then we help them launch their social change organizations. Um, we were founded 22 years ago by the senior leadership of General Atlantic, which is a private equity firm headquartered in Greenwich with offices all over the world. And to these guys' credits, and they are all guys, um, to their credit, they made a lot of money in the mid, uh, early to mid 80s, uh, mainly in tech investments. And to their credit, they sort of said, well, now what? What's our real legacy going to be? And they decided it should be a philanthropic legacy. So what could they give back after they had done so well themselves? Um, and they really were on the cutting edge and sort of the, the leading edge of this notion of adapting business principles and practices to the social sector. So, you know, one day when the comprehensive history of social entrepreneurship is written, the founders of General Atlantic and Echoing Green will really be sort of one of the pioneering organizations and these guys will really be considered um, innovators at the leading edge of this field. So, um, again, a number of you raised your hand having heard of Echoing Green, but a number of you have not. And that's sort of the way we've done our work. It's never been about Echoing Green the investor. It's always been about um, the folks that we fund. And I guarantee you, you've heard of some of the uh, 450 plus social entrepreneurs that we've uh, funded over the past 20 years. So um, we were seed funders of Teach for America, uh, City Year, um, SKS Microcredit, uh, which is the fastest growing microcredit institution uh, in all of India, 180% uh, annual growth rate. It's actually a for-profit social enterprise. Um, having served about three and a half uh, million women in 20,000 slums and villages across India. Um, if any of you ever ride the subways in New York City, we were seed funders in a group called Freelancers Union, which is a premier portable benefits association that is redefining the social safety net um, for today's workforce. Um, and I could go on and on and on, um, but it, it suffices to say that we're really good at picking winners. Um, so when people come to us and you know, these young people, their parents think they're crazy because they're not going to graduate school like they were expected to. When they're sort of taking on the status quo and saying things aren't working in, in the field that I care about, so I'm going to do something different, Echoing Green has traditionally been there to champion them and say, you know what, uh, great idea. We don't know if it's going to work, but we're going to take um, the chance on you and to see what you can do. So I was telling David um, and Matt and Kate and Paul over lunch, um, I think the beauty, the magic of Echoing Green is it really gives young people like you the permission to fly, to really go off road. And again, when the world is going in one direction, when the world is zigging, Echoing Green fellows and social entrepreneurs zag. And I think it's just really as simple as that. Um, so are we as good as I say we are? So how, how, how do you know um, that I'm not just blowing smoke? Um, so I can tell you a couple things. So on a macro level, as I said, we've invested in about 450 social entrepreneurs working in 40 plus countries around the world and close to 42 states in this country. 
Uh, the first thing I'll tell you is that 85% of these social entrepreneurs will remain in the social sector in key leadership positions, and that's pretty darn good from a talent pipeline perspective. So these are young people who could go to McKinsey, they could go to Wall Street, um, they could go and do a variety of other things, but they choose to dedicate their intellectual capital to the social sector and taking on really tough social problems. So that's the first indicator. The second uh, indicator I'll provide you with is organizational sustainability. Again, we're risk capitalists. We are first funders in. Um, but despite that sort of um, risk tolerance and, and, and investing first, about 67% of the organizations that we invest in are sustainable in the short, medium, and longer term. And that's really darn good. When I tell this to potential investors, mostly Wall Street guys, their eyes get really big when they're like, you've got to be kidding. You've got a sustainability rate of 67%. When you realize that the vast majority of new businesses fail, the fact that you know our organizational sustainability rate is so high is impressive. We can sort of dig underneath that because it really is sort of a proxy measure and it's not as clean and precise as I'm making it out to be, but it is a useful um, stat. And then the last um, stat that I'll provide you with is simply dollars in, dollars out. I mean, we have invested collectively a small amount of money, about $27 million in these um, launching uh, social change organizations. Well, they've gone on to garner close to a billion dollars in additional public and private resources. That's a pretty darn good ROI, return on investment of about 44 to 1. So again, when you're sort of looking for the leverage of your investment, how much are you getting back for what you're putting in? Um, I think those are pretty good proxy measures, pretty good proxy indicators. A couple years ago, uh, Echoing Green had the good fortune of working um, with some graduate students, uh, bless you, from NYU, who spent a semester with us and said, you know, okay, you gave us sort of those, um, you know, proxy measures for success. Uh, that still doesn't quite get at it. How else can you determine if you're really good at what you do? So um, they had a brilliant insight um, that I think you'll find very interesting. So how does Equine Green, uh, how do we do our work? We actually do our work through an annual business plan competition. So every fall, we open up our website, we send out a global call for applications, and every year we get over 1,000 applications from 83 countries around the world, people you know who want to start any number of interesting types of social change organizations um, through a rigorous and you know downright Darwinian and cruel um, vetting process we're only going to select about one and a half percent of those who actually apply for this uh, funding so um, through the course of five and a half grueling months we put these folks through their paces we ask for a first application then a more fleshed out business plan letters of recommendations a telephone interview and then our business plan competition culminates in this um, weekend in New York where we get 18 or so volunteer judges, they're um, private equity guys, they're venture capital guys, they're academics, they're community activists, they're Equine Green alums, who really just sort of pressure test these applicants, putting them through their ba uh, paces, poking holes in their business plans, and out of that weekend we'll select our new class of fellows. So at the end of this, uh, that weekend, which is happening for us in about three weeks, um, we're inviting 23 groups in from all over the world. We're only going to fund 15. So we're going to send a little less than um, half home without the fellowship program. But you can imagine that those folks that we sent home are actually the perfect control group to see what happens. We thought they were so good. In fact, we were close to funding them. And for a variety of reasons, they just didn't quite make the cut. So it essentially, we call them near fellows. So they're near social entrepreneurs. We thought they were pretty darn good, just not quite good enough. So we have started tracking what happens to these folks um, after not receiving the Echoing Green Fellowship. And the data is very interesting. So we find um, a couple of things. Fully 40% of those we send home without the Echoing Green Fellowship never go on to start their organization. Their ideas sort of die on the vine. And some will say that's good because you don't need to start everything just because it's a good idea. It's all, you know, a lot of this is all in the execution. Um, but the thought that, you know, there were really some good ideas out there and with the, without the Echoing Green intervention, um, we lose some of these good ideas to the social sector. So that's the first uh, point of data I'll provide with you. Um, I will also tell you that we looked at the progress of these near fellows compared with Equine Green Fellows. And what we found is that um, across seven different organizational development variables, Echoing Green Fellows um, outperformed these near fellows in a statistically significant way. So their boards um, grew faster. They hired more people more quickly. Their fundraising trajectory was uh, steeper. Um, their presence in the media um, um, more dramatic and then more media hits, um, more thought leadership opportunities. So essentially the conclusion was that Echo and Green really does function as an accelerator. We help these very talented social change leaders get farther, 
faster. Um, so in terms of social impact, are you doing what you say you're doing? Um, those are some of the um, statistics and some of the information I'm able to provide you. It is difficult for us because essentially we're patient capital, right? I mean, we invest in these people today, and it could be 20 years before we see the impact of their work. But that's our business model. And fortunately, we have investors in a community who's comfortable with that long-term investment. And it makes sense, given that we're in the business of driving positive social change. And social change uh, takes a really long time, and it's really hard to do. Um, so I think I'm actually going to stop there if you, know, you guys got a sense of who we are, how we've done our work. Um, and then I think we should just sort of open it up for questions. Right, right. And so we actually uh, defer to our fellows um, and their organizations. So we spend a lot of time looking at their annual reports and staying in touch with our alums. So for example, you know, when Wendy Cobb talks about Teach for, uh, Teach for America, and she'll tell you that about you know, 66, 68% of the young people that she worked with stay involved in teaching uh, for a significant amount of time. That's one variable. You can look at academic achievement gains of Teach for America core members relative to other teachers, and there's a statistically significant difference. So we actually do try to track what our fellows organizations are doing. It's difficult because we are program agnostic and we are geographically agnostic. So we are we will fund anywhere in the world and we will fund anything. So we're as likely to fund an arts program, arts and literacy program in the Bronx, to a microcredit program in rural Kenya, um, a healthcare, a global development program um, working across countries. So it gets very difficult to find a common lens to, to measure this. So we actually do rely quite heavily on the social entrepreneur and her organization um, to provide us with their impact measures and their impact models. Um, it's not perfect, but that's the best we got. Um, and that's just sort of our philosophical framework, because we do believe that that agnostic approach to investing makes sense. We would never deign to understand or believe that we could solve community problems from the outside looking in. We think that community change happens from the bottom up. And we believe that indigenous leaders coming to us, if you can make the case, if we think you are a powerful potential leader of promise and you, we believe you can execute, we'll give you a chance. And we assume that you know better than we um, on how you're going to execute and drive towards that particular type of change you're working on. I would say no, because part of it is we don't give a lot of money. I mean, you know, we are um, uh, true seed funders, and interestingly enough, and this is something that I'm working on, um, the amount of money that we give in terms of a cash outlay has not kept pace with inflation. And I'll talk more about this later, but I was an Equine Green Fellow almost 16 years ago, and literally Equine Green Fellows today don't get that much more than what I got 16 years ago. Uh, but the interesting thing is, um, and that I said this as an Equine Green Fellow as alum, the network is actually more important than the money. So this, being an entrepreneur, whether you're a for-profit entrepreneur or a not-for-profit entrepreneur, this is lonely work. People think you're crazy. You're taking on the status quo. You're taking on existing norms and constraints, and you're pushing against an entrenched system. That is really lonely, difficult, hard work. And in fact, the psychic boost that our social entrepreneurs get of being part of a like-minded community, um, time and time again, we hear it's more valuable than the cash. Um, so I don't think the money is an indicator, because in fact, the folks that go on to start their organizations um, are raising money. Um, it's just our fellows are doing a little bit better. Um, so I actually don't think it's the money differential. I actually think it's the network that really matters. I also think it's the cachet of becoming part of the Echoing Green community. Um, those who know social entrepreneurship and know us, we are a best-in-class brand 
end. And we've often had funders who said, I waited to see if this person got the Echoing Green Fellowship before I put my money in. Because people, some investors actually have fairly low risk tolerance and they want to wait for others to get into the space before they invest. So I actually think the money is actually pretty low on the factors that um, um, make the difference. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, again, I think that um, technology, um, you know, social networking, Web 2.0 has actually really facilitated um, this sort of idea diffusion and information sharing. Um, a lot of it is pretty basic. So what you find when you're starting something is you at first think you're the only one confronting this problem. And you realize quite quickly when you reach out to your network that somebody, whether they're doing microcredit in Bangladesh or whether they're doing, you know, educational inequity in the Bronx, you're confronting the same sorts of problems as an executive director. And if you can share those solutions of, you know, which accounting program should I use for a burgeoning organization? What's the best fundraising software when my organizational budget is under 300000 These are the sorts of quick answers that you can get by sharing um, with one another. I think that's one thing. I think also, um, you can't discount the psychic comfort you get um, of working with people, even if they're in a different industry than you or focusing on a different problem. Just being in it together is incredibly important. And I do think there's a level of cross-fertilization that happens when you're actually not just in a fellowship program or just in a community of education social entrepreneurs, but you're actually sharing practices, sharing ideas with those who are doing, you know, sustainable development, who are doing appropriate technology, who are doing health care um, reform. Coming together across sector is actually fairly liberating and it prevents you from getting stuck in those normative constraints that happens to anyone if they're in a field long enough. Um, so I think, you know, people just being willing to reach out to one another, to help one another. And I can't actually discount the power of our alumni of supporting our younger fellows. I've never had a case where a, a, an emerging social entrepreneur um, in our community has picked up the phone and an alumni has not called them back. I mean, you remember what it felt like when you were struggling and you didn't have anywhere to turn. And that benefit you get from being part of this broader community is incredibly powerful. I will say that um, a lot of foundations, like the Rockefeller Foundation and others, are starting to invest more in open innovation technology platforms. Um, and this is independent of social entrepreneurship. But the idea that you know any company anywhere in the world um, can put, and this is a, I think it's a great um, organization called Innocentive, um, they can put up a problem that an engineer is having or a company is having somewhere in the world. And individuals sitting at their computer who can figure out a solution to this problem can weigh in and potentially um, get financially remunerated for it. So I think there's some really cool stuff that's happening with sort of open source information sharing that really is sort of on the cutting edge of doing this kind of social entrepreneurship work. No, it doesn't make sense. Okay, explain the. So you, so you, you work at Green, yep. Right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Right? Oh, instead of running another organization, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Oh, that's a great question. So you know, um, I you know, okay, so 16 years ago, um, I was right across. Um, you know, Harvard Square at the Kennedy School of Government. I had taken time off from Harvard Medical School to get my Master's of Public Policy. Um, and, uh, okay, let me, let me back up. So, you know, I um, went to college here. So I spent my freshman year in Weld Hall and then I got quadded. Is that still a bad thing? Like, it was a big deal. I was like, oh, I got quadded. I was up at Courier. Is this still called Courier House? I was up at Courier House. And I spent all my time in um, Hillis. I was a pre-med. Um, and I was sort of like, probably unlike a lot of you, I was like sort of a wonky, nerdy pre-med. I was history and science. Okay, all right. I was. I'm just, I, I'm just calling myself out. So I was like doing my, you know, um, calculus stuff, my biochem stuff, um, history and science stuff. Um, and I wasn't actually all that involved in like Phillips Brooks House or anything. I was just um, focusing on making the grade, doing my MCATs, all that kind of stuff. Um, I actually took a couple years off 
after college. Uh, you know, I was the first person in my family uh, to go to an Ivy League, big deal, and then first person in my family to become a doctor, really big deal. It was the dream, like at the Christmas dinner table, oh, we got a doctor in the family. So there was all this pressure to do, do, do. Um, so, you know, I ended up taking two years off from college because I actually, in my heart of hearts, didn't want to be a doctor, but I didn't have the nerve to tell my parents that I didn't want to be a doctor. I actually wanted to be a PhD. I wanted to become a historian of science. That was my true passion. Um, but when, you know, your whole family's hopes and dreams are sitting on your shoulder, it's a little tough to, to say no. So I took a couple years off after um, college. I went down to Washington, D.C. I worked for the National Academy of Sciences doing some really cool research on the status of African Americans from World War II to the present. The thought was that for the um, uh, 88 uh, election, 1988 presidential election, um, having this research on the status of blacks relative to others would really sort of change the debate of the presidential election. So I got to work with really cool people, a lot of folks from Harvard, whether it was David Elwood, Nathan Glazer, some really cool professors. Um, and then when I sort of couldn't avoid deferring medical school any longer, I sort of couldn't think of anything else to do, so I went to medical school. Um, fortunately, um, Harvard Med School, um, the year I entered, dispensed with the um, you know eight hours a day being lectured at um, and started something called the New Pathway. Um, and it was sort of a case study method. They sort of went to the business school model of doing um, medical school. And that was great because it actually gave me a lot of free time to do other stuff uh, that I was much more interested in. Uh, so I got to you know hang out in Roxbury, uh, Dorchester, Mattapan. I got to learn about the Kennedy School. I ended up you know getting my degree from the Kennedy School of Masters of Public Policy. And so when you talk about your life changing in a moment, um, I know that sounds a little corny, but every once in a while it does happen. So, and I think it was 87 or 88, I was reading the Boston Globe, and there was this five-part series called Birth in the Death Zones. And it was a story of how black babies a block away from my medical school were dying at three times the rate of white babies. And I literally couldn't believe it. I'm like, you're telling me we got Brigham and Women's, you got Mass General, you got Children's Hospital, and I can walk two blocks away and a, a baby you know, is going to, you know, a black baby, simply because of their zip code, because of the color of their skin, is not going to get a fair chance at life. And I still get chills. The first, the cover picture was this young woman, young mother, kneeling before the grave of her baby that she had to bury. And I just, like I said, I still get so choked up about it. And I was like, this isn't right. And, you know, sometimes in your life, you know, there are tons of problems. It's easier for most of us to turn away. But for whatever reason, I could not turn away from that and it became my problem. It was my responsibility in my small way to try to do something about it. So I spent the next couple of years trying to figure out what to do about that. So the first thing about it is if you see a problem that really gets to you for whatever reason, you better get really smart on it. So I was like, well, I better find out what the heck is infant mortality, what are the causes, and what I very quickly found out, it's actually not a medical problem, it's a, um, a health problem that has socioeconomic causes. It doesn't happen because, you know, it happens because these babies um, are born into poor families, the parents don't have um, transportation to get health care services, they don't have health insurance. Um, and then the second thing I did after I got, you know, fairly smart on the issue was to actually reach out to the community and say, um, is there anything I can do to help? So again, it's the notion of um, being, the ser being a servant to the communities you work with and, and thinking of them as customers as, and constituents and going in and saying, I have some skills, can I be of service? Um, and in doing that kind of community-based outreach, my colleague and I um, started the family van. So essentially, after talking to a lot of people, we started this um, mobile health unit that essentially provides um, free medical screening, outreach services um, to the most disadvantaged populations in Boston. Um, and you know, again, we you know developed this program at my colleague's kitchen table. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. We had never started anything, but we knew we cared a lot about the issue, a lot about the community. And Echoing Green believed in me first when every traditional funder said, you're a graduate student, you've never run anything, why would we invest in you? So that was a transformative experience for me. So in that moment, I never forgot when Echoing Green said, we don't think you're crazy, we think you're a great investment because we, we love your passion and we want to see what you make of it. So like I said, I've always been grateful to Echoing Green for that and I saw what it did to my life and I saw what it did to people like Wendy Kopp who, you know, wrote her senior thesis at Princeton on this idea of a, a young person's teaching core and her senior thesis advisor said, oh, that's interesting, it won't work, but good for you. Um, and then look, you know, here we are 15, 20 years later and look what she's done. And so I believed in this model 
um, to, to let young people and potential leaders fly and potentially change the world. And it's a romantic notion, but it's actually a hard edge business model because I've seen it work time and time again. Um, and then part of it is the notion of what do you do best. It turns out I'm not a great manager. I don't like detail stuff. I get bored with the you know spreadsheets. I don't even know really how to do a spreadsheet. Like, it's not my thing. It's not my shtick. But I'm a really good big picture person. I network well. I'm a, I'm a great behind the scenes person telling people you can do it. I believe in you. So it just so happens that my fit is an echoing green model, sort of being behind the scenes, pushing amazing leaders forward as opposed to running a direct service organization myself. And again, I only figured that out after doing a lot of different things over the years. But um, you know, you sort of figure out. Um, you know what your path is in life and I you know this is it this is my sweet spot I mean I'm not an athlete so people talk about being in the zone I never felt that and when I did sports in school I don't I'm terrible at that but I know what it feels like to be in the zone of my work life be in the zone of social change I'm absolutely clear that this is what I was meant to do and this is my best and highest value as a social change agent and again I only figured it out um, uh, by sort of being out there and this notion of gratitude, I'm so grateful to Echoing Green for what it did to my life. I want subsequent generations to have that opportunity just like I did. Uh, great question, because I'm immersed in that. I'm obsessed with that now, because we're almost finishing our new strategic planning process. So as I told some students this morning, institutions, um, once an institution is created, part of its raison d'etre is to make sure it keeps on existing. And so part of the focus of any institution is about the perpetuation of that institution. And I don't believe in that. Institutions should not, be, should not exist in perpetuity unless they're doing good work and adding value. And I think it's incumbent, at least it's incumbent for my organization, to periodically check in and say, are we still relevant? Are we still adding value? And we asked ourselves that question starting a couple years ago. And the first answer was, you know what? We are still relevant, but we're relevant in a different way. 22 years ago, Echoing Green was the only game in town. There was nowhere to go for you know young, aspiring social entrepreneurs to go. People didn't know what a social entrepreneur was. You couldn't get seed capital. So we, we had a monopoly on this space. Um, and fortunately, the field has really taken off, especially in the last you know, eight to 10 years. So we are no longer the only game in town. And I would say, relative to some of the big guns in the space, whether it's the Skoll Foundation or Ashoka, we are one of the smallest players. We still sort of own the niche of startup seed capital, um, but we are dwarfed in size and brand recognition relative to some of these other folks. So it, it requires you in thinking about, you know, now that the field has changed, which we certainly take credit for because we were one of the pioneers of this field, and and we're proud of the way that it's um, grown and developed and blossomed. But it's what, is, what can we do now, um, given the way the field looks today? And I think there um, are a couple things. So I think our brand, is our brand of social entrepreneurship is particularly resonant with young people like you. So it's the notion of, again, how do you um, provide the, the space? How do you create the ecosystem? for you all um, to you know, have the permission to fly in, in your own lives. And again, we were talking about this at lunch. You know, I go, I speak you know, to thousands of young people a year, and I always get invited to sit on these panels. How do you start a new organization? And I literally stand up, and I was like, hi, I'm Cheryl. I run Equin Green. Please don't start another organization. And people are like, you know, we invited you here to talk about starting an organization, and you're telling us not to start one. And I really believe strongly in this. Um, the nonprofit sector, the social sector is crazy, bless you. Literally 141 new nonprofits are started every day. We've got about a one and a half million nonprofits in this country. It is ridiculous. This sector is duplicative, it is inefficient, you know, we're constrained in terms of resources. And the, what worries me about the field of social entrepreneurship is that we're increasingly conflating success with being a founder or starting something. That's precisely the wrong message. And what I like about Echoing Green is, that its sweet spot, its message, is a human capital talent development argument. It is if you can find your best and highest use in the world, um, and if you, if you reach for your North Star of social change, you can do it as a COO, you can do it as a CFO, 
You can do it as an investment banker at Goldman Sachs, either doing double bottom line, triple bottom line, impact investing, or a terrific board member. You can do it as a teacher. So the idea that Echoing Green should be disseminating the message that finding your sweet spot, finding your zone, is the best way for you to go about and make change in the world. That's one thing. So I think as we move forward, our work is going to be less about the 15 or 20 emerging social entrepreneurs that we work with each year um, to work with many more thousands of young people who are trying to figure out their career trajectory in the world. And I think just some of the you know lessons um, of Echoing Green Fellows are more uh, broadly applicable than just those folks who are starting a social entrepreneurial enterprise. The other piece that I will say is, um, although our fellowship is a, a two-year funded fellowship and then another two years of technical support, um, now that we've been in this business for 20 years, we're starting to see that first wave of alumni who um, have become what I call super influential leaders. And this my aha moment was when I was volunteering for the Obama tra uh, transition. And literally every other day I'd look up and yet another echoing green alum was like traipsing through the transition offices, you know, talking to the incoming administration. And I was like, oh my gosh, these folks, 20 years in, have achieved proof of concept. They are thought leaders in their field. And they're now, you know, structuring um, the national debate in a particular field. So you couldn't make the case that investing in Echoing Green alums is actually a better use of limited capital than perhaps even investing in a new emerging social entrepreneur because these alumni are changing the way our country is working. And I'll give you a great example. So in 1995, we invested in Van Jones, amazing social entrepreneur who was funded by Echoing Green to start um, an anti-brutality police hotline in, in Oakland. He then went on to start a terrific human rights organization called the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights that did a lot of jobs, not jails work, um, you know, um, you know, anti-prison uh, industrial complex work in Oakland. He then got very um, interested in the connection between green jobs as a driver of economic development and inner city youth development and how you could bring the two together. And if any of you sort of follow the public debate, he wrote a New York Times bestseller called The Green Collar Job Economy which in fact, Senator Obama at the time based his entire green jobs platform up, uh, on. So now, you know, I just saw him in, in D.C. at the White House last week. He just moved into the administration as sort of essentially the green jobs are for the administration. That's an extraordinary trajectory. You know, here's a guy, been a community activist, social entrepreneur, um, had this big vision of how to sort of move forward in the 21st century with alternative energy, greening of the economy, um, and is potentially poised to do some really big things. So the notion of Echoing Green of providing additional supports for our alum as they are poised to take on this role as super influential thought leader is a new direction for us, but one that we think could potentially be incredibly impactful when you're trying to shift the, the national and global debate. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question, and, and I, yeah, it, it does make for an interesting case study. So a couple things. Change is always hard. So there is inertia that's created when you're trying to take any organization in a new direction. Um, so I would say I've definitely encountered some resistance with my staff um, in trying to pull us um, in, in this new direction. Um, I also um, have been challenged um, at the board level um, where essentially, you know, my board is wonderful. We wouldn't be where we are without them. But they are not immersed in this work. They don't live and breathe this stuff the way that I do. And it's been interesting to try to educate and bring them along um, when I only sort of see them, you know, once a quarter to talk about, you know, what we're doing. Um, so it, it has been difficult from that perspective. And I, I would say that I, um, I think I have not 
built as strong a process as I should to get buy-in for this new strategic direction, and I'm sort of paying for it now. So, for example, we had a board meeting a couple months ago where I sort of unveiled the next phase of this new strategic direction. I was really excited. I had my PowerPoints. And it was very clear to me that my board was like, uh, okay. Like, I, I didn't spend the upfront, um, you know, behind-the-scenes work bringing them along and committee and um, keeping them abreast of how we were thinking about things. So I think I failed in that regard. The other interesting lesson for me um, which is something that I'm sure you guys will see, is the problem of, um, and I'm not the founder of the organization, but in some ways I am treated like the founder of the organization in that my board really does defer to me. This uh, Equine Green is a staff-driven organization as opposed to a board-driven organization. And it was interesting, the response I got from my board, who said, you know, we better go along with this new strategic direction because we don't want Cheryl to leave and go work for the Obama administration. Like, yeah, well, let, let's do this because we want to keep her here. We want to keep her happy. And it's interesting that that, it, to me, was a, that was a leadership failure and management failure on my part because I didn't do my job in setting up this process so that my board got buy-in at the level that they needed to to embrace this new direction. I know we will get there because, I, you know, I saw the red flag and I'm sort of, uh, in fact, I've got a conference call this afternoon where I'm talking to my executive committee about how we do some more, um, you know, board discussions to get them up to speed. But it is really hard to do this. But again, um, I think to be, uh, to have integrity for your organization. And again, I think you need to justify your existence. And again, I think we have to get out of this idea that closing an organization, merging an organization, that should be okay. That should actually be a, a good response for um, the way that fields change and morph and all that kind of stuff. Um, so I think Echoing Green will get there, um, but it has been an interesting challenge for me trying to pull an organization along um, to, to, to where I think we need to go. Sure, and I think that's really important. Um, so, a couple of things. I don't do. Have they read Forces for Good, David? Yeah. Okay. So, a great book that um, it's actually really fun reading. Yeah. <laughs> so, Forces for Good, written by two Equine Green alum, Leslie Crutchfield and Heather McLeod Grant. They were terrific Equine Green fellows in the mid '80s. They started the first magazine for social entrepreneurs called Who Cares. Um, it's actually no longer in existence, but it, it was ahead of its time. It was a great magazine for the years that it was in operation. Um, they both went off to business school, um, and they spent three years. Um, translating and adapting Jim Collins' methodology from good to great um, and applied it to the social sector. And they asked a very simple but profound question, what makes great nonprofits great? That was their, you know, that was their question. So they did sort of the, you know, they, they sent out thousands of questionnaires to find out what people, bless you, in our sector thought were sort of the top, you know, social sector organizations of the day. They went it down to a list of 12. Um, they then um, spent three years, you know, researching um, and came up with the six practices that make great nonprofits great. Um, and I won't go through all of them, but one um, that I thought was really important was this notion that great nonprofits build networks and make allies and partners of others in their space. And I think, you know, when, when you start to focus on the organization as opposed to the problem you're trying to solve, you start to lose sight of what you're in the business to do. And all of these great nonprofits are in the business of driving profound social change. And once you sort of shift your framework to that, you immediately realize how small you are in the universe relative to that problem. There is no organization, one organization, that will ever solve poverty, that will ever solve educational inequity or healthcare inequity. It has to be, that change has to come uh, in the form of a big social movement. And these great nonprofits realize that they are simply a part of this larger puzzle, and all of their work um, becomes, and I love the terminology, in the form of co-optition. Good competition is good, but it has to be seen in the spirit of a larger system of cooperation so that you all sort of drive change together. Um, so I think the notion of working in partnership, realizing that you're part of a larger ecosystem, 
um, and that you have to start engaging other systems um, than the one in which you work. So this is, this is, I don't know if you've talked about this in other classes, this is an interesting moment for social entrepreneurs. In many ways, the field of social entrepreneurship started to gain currency when folks started to say, the government can't fix these problems. The government doesn't know what he's doing. Doesn't know what it's doing. We individuals, smart individuals, have to come and fix it ourselves. The government is the problem. They're not the solution. So for the past 25 years or so, it's all been about government broken, social safety net of the government not going to work. We'll come in and fix it. And you now have a whole generation of social entrepreneurs that are realizing that the scale and scope of these problems is so huge that unless you start to engage other sy systemic levers like policy, um, like you know, working in partnership with the government, we're never going to get to the answer in this stuff. So I think you're starting to see new operating procedures in our sector um, in terms of alliances, partnerships with government, partnerships with um, businesses, um, breaking down boundaries and silos. Um, so you work across sector um, and you use whatever tool in the toolkit you need to to get to whatever change you're driving for. And I think that's an exciting part of the field. Yep, I mean, I wish I could say um, it was always uh, deliberate and intentional. That's the way it should be, right? You should be sort of mission driven and you should use um, you know, your, your mission and your focus as a screen in terms of inviting people in. It's sort of, in the, in the real world, it sort of doesn't work like that. You're, op you're often opportunistic. So it's often then a board member or someone who comes to you and in a constrained environment that most of us work in in the not-for-profit sector, you sort of take whatever partnerships look good and you sort of, you know, patch it together to make it work. So in fact, you know, the value and utility of networks is it brings new opportunities to you that you might not otherwise have. Um, so for example, how did we get the BCG folks, um, Boston Consulting Group? Oh gosh, we've worked with them for so long. I mean, I think it's a combination of things. So. Um, you know, a, a lot of these, a, a lot of um, law firms came to us because they are desperate to provide pro bono opportunities for their associates and for their law firms. They need an outlet for that. Um, we're looking for technical support for our fellows as they're incorporating, getting their 501c3. So that's sort of a match made in heaven, right? That's easy. And the same thing with the consulting firms. On an individual basis, um, you know, some, you know, people just find their way to us. I mean, it is a bit like matchmaking, you know. Something about Echoing Green speaks to them on a very deep level. Um, you know, we're trying to build a community of supporters and champions, and you just sort of find your way to one another. So again, it's not as rigorous and thoughtful as it should be, or, or as you might think. But I think that's also one of the interesting things about the field, because you sort of never know where these opportunities are going to take you. But I think if you sort of manage them and try to think about them through the framework of your larger strategic direction, you kind of figure it out. So it, I, it's not, I'm not going as so far as to say it's been haphazard the way we built it. It's been a little more thoughtful than that. But you know, we all tend to, to be fairly opportunistic and we're always looking for that next potential funder, that next potential partnership. And more often than not, it, it happens that way. Yeah, you know, we, um, by the time our fellows make it through the process, we've pretty much kicked the tire on their theory of change. Um, and because we're early stage, it really is proof of concept. So a lot of time, we're not going to know if the theory of change uh, bears fruit, but we're willing to give it a chance. So when you look, you know, three years out, you know, 99% of our folks are still in operation because they're building. They're just trying to build. So we don't see a lot of um, failure in the early days. Um, I would say in the early days of Echoing Green, we did see more failures because often we'd have really bright, energetic, passionate young people um, who would go off, um, you know, to, you know, a another country 
and say, I'm going to do this work in this country without being embedded in the community, um, having developed trusted relationships, and it was just an abject failure. Um, and I think we've gotten better over the years in understanding the importance of indigenous leadership for the success of a project. And I don't mean, and, I, and I'm defining indigenous broadly, you don't have to be from that community to be indigenous, but you have to be of that community, meaning you understand the context, you are accepted as a member of that community, and that's sort of um, you know, a, a deal breaker if you're not I I indigenous in a way that you've um, you know, become a part of that community, you sort of um, you know, paid your dues there, and so we don't see that type of failure anymore. Um, so, you know, I, again, this is such long-term work and, you know, when we have seen fa failures or when organizations have ceased to exist, um, quite often it's because of the lack, you know, a lack of financial sustainability. They've not been able to sustain um, the organization as opposed to the theory um, of change not working and quite often um, what I love about Echoing Green is we're really out in front. We, well, I like to say we fund people who can see around corners. And we often see and fund people who are so far out ahead of their movement, it may be 30 years before the rest of the movement will catch up to them. So they, they actually have a very difficult time um, de becoming sustainable because they're really just out there. Um, so, you know, it makes it hard to, de to decide success or failure. Um, and we don't see that as a failure because we believe we've put a, a, a new leader into the space that even if the organization doesn't continue, their voice as a thought leader will. So it's tricky. I don't have a great answer for you on that. I'm sorry. It's just tough. Yep. Yeah, so we'll see because it's still very early. Um, but you know, during the campaign, um, the president, the senator, and then president-elect um, talked about a couple of things. So um, part of his um, social innovation platform was um, his commitment to make um, service opportunities available to many more millions of Americans than currently exist. And he is already making good on that promise in two ways. One is uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, the Kennedy Serve Act, it started off as the Kennedy Hatch um, Service Act, um, was passed and it will be signed by the president hopefully in the next seven to ten days where they've essentially tripled the number of slots for national service. That's a really big deal. You know, we have not seen that um, level of expansion of national service, certainly not in your lifetime. So that's a big push. Um, the president is also, um, the administration is also working to create technology platforms that will allow many more Americans to engage um, where they are, however they're able to in service. So you hear a lot of folks in the volunteerism world who are saying that, you know, I live in Duluth. Well, I, there are not a lot of places for me to go. I, you know, if I live in, 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 in Cambridge, there are tons of places I can find to go and volunteer. But what if I live in Duluth? Um, so how does technology enable those sorts of matches to be made, whether um, we just do a better job of getting local organizations in Duluth online, or even more interesting, the notion of developing skills-based volunteering. So how do you get you know, a lawyer in Duluth who can you know, use technology to support the, the pro bono legal needs of an organization that could be anywhere in the country. So there's some work afoot with companies like Google and others that are trying to build that enabling technology to provide the on-ramp for many more millions of Americans. So I'm excited about that. Um, the thing that I was most involved in on the transition was this uh, creation of a community solutions fund or a social investment fund, um, which was part of the Kennedy uh, Serve Act. Um, and with the passage of this legislation, we will see um, a pilot fund, we don't know how much of anywhere from maybe $150 million to $500 million of capital to help proven um, social innovations go to scale and a little bit of money for um, innovative new ideas. So I think this is really exciting. Um, th the devil will be in the details. We don't know how it's going to work. We don't know who's going to distribute the funds. We don't know who's eligible to get the funds yet. This is what the White House Office of Social Innovation will be working on over the next couple of months. They've got to figure all this stuff out. Uh, the last piece I will say is that, again, and I think this is potentially the most powerful um, role that the administration can play, is to use the bully pulpit, pulpit to shine a light on social innovation and to really drive home the message that individual citizens 
can take on problems in their community and solve them. So I think what we'll see over the next couple of the years may be a points of light type of um, you know, program where once a week the president on his radio address highlights some terrific social entrepreneur doing work. You can imagine a White House conference on social innovation. I think all that stuff will come. So, you know, again, I, I think they come by this honestly. You know, the president, community organizer, he believes bottom up and that the government cannot run this stuff, but they can be a catalytic, effective partner to people doing this. And the first lady, you know, she was the founding director of the, the Chicago Office of Public Allies, which Echoing Green seated. So she's a social entrepreneur herself. So again, you've got, um, you got the two principals who really care about this. So I think it will get a lot of airtime over the next couple of years. So I'm excited about that. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, we, um, unlike, say, in Ashoka, which is decentralized, they have in-country offices, so they work with people um, who are native, who speak language. We're, you know, I got, you know, I got 13 staff people, um, you know, a couple who speak Spanish, but we, we just don't have the facility. We can't take applications from indigenous leaders who are absolutely qualified um, do it, uh, to do this work, and it's not a failure on their part. It, it is a limitation on ours. So at some point, you've got to narrowly focus on what you can deliver. We don't have the wherewithal and the resources or the bandwidth to work with all terrific emerging leaders. We can only work with those um, that we are best suited to serve. So again, those with fluency in English, so we can um, put them together in networks of others who speak um, the same language. Um, also, those who have some facility and understanding with the U.S. nonprofit context. So for example, a lot of the folks that we fund overseas will often have an office here in the U.S. as well as their in-country office. Um, you know, I'm not going to be that helpful telling someone how to negotiate the civil society in Bangladesh, but I'm really good at talking about how you navigate it here. So again, part of it is how can we d best deploy our expertise to work with a particular group of social entrepreneurs. It is not the only model. It's not necessarily the best model, but it's what we have to work with. Um, so in some ways, it's sort of understanding what you're capable of delivering and then really focusing on that. Yep. Yep. So um, I, I want to make clear that, first of all, we do believe that the business, planning comp the business planning competition in and of itself is an invaluable form of technical support. So I often have people who come up to me and say, you know, I applied for the fellowship. I didn't get it, but I really thank you for the opportunity for putting me through my paces. So the rigor you have to go through as an emerging social entrepreneur, you better be able to come up with your budget. You better be able to justify um, your theory of change. You better get a sense of what activities you're going to execute on to get to your intended level of impact. So we believe that as soon as somebody um, approaches and interfaces with Echo and Grey, the technical support has started. That's the first thing. Once they're selected as fellows over the course of four years, they attend five skills building conferences. So in addition to the networking, there are peer-to-peer -peer learning sessions on, you know, what's the best financial modeling system for your organization? How do you develop your board of directors? We've got a suite of tools um, that we deploy to help these organizations get better. As part of their first year requirement to us, they have to submit a strategic plan to us where they sort of walk through with us their expected activities, you know, inputs, outcomes, all that kind of stuff. And we track that the first couple of years to see if they're executing against those, um, you know, uh, benchmarks that they've laid out. They submit um, twice yearly reports to us so we can do check-ins. Um, you know, a lot of these folks are 
Um, you know, some people get very little hand holding because either they're so on top of it, they're just moving like lightning, um, or they're so early stage that a lot of it is theoretical and they're still just doing some of the background research. Um, but there are a few that you sort of say, we've got limited resources, maybe we need to direct our attention to these folks that we see maybe hitting a rough patch. So we do have some points of intervention um, that we, um, um, you know, use to work with our fellows to help them get farther faster. Again, the network here does matter, though because we will often reach out to um, donors, supporters, individuals, firms who can provide, you know, accounting support, who might actually want to have a governance function by joining the board. So we provide sort of an array of patched together um, services. But I'll be very clear, we are not in the business of organizational development. We are in the business of human capital development. So our sweet spot, our real focus in the space of social entrepreneurship is about the individual leader. Um, it, it, certainly independent of the idea over time, there are, plen there are thousands of organizations and consultants who can provide organizational development support. Our best and highest use is supporting that leader um, through their career trajectory, and that's our focus. Yeah, yeah, and he's sort of the, the four Ashoka criteria. Ours are not dissimilar, but we think about it in a slightly different way. Um, you know, on a macro level, um, you know, again, when people get to us, you know, Ashoka will fund after proof of concept, so the person is sort of in mid-launch stage. They've gotten some traction. There's some methodology to show that this is probably a good systems-changing idea. Echoing Green invests before that. So we're investing in human capital and talent. So a lot of what we look at is the promise and potential of leadership. And we get there through a variety of measures. It's you know letters of recommendation. It's how does someone present their idea both on paper and in person? How persuasive are they? And some of it is just gut instinct. You know, my board chair, who's one of the most successful VC guys I know, says, you know, I still, you know, at the end of the day, I'll look across the table. And when I'm about to make a for-profit investment, I sort of say, you know, does this person move me? Do I believe in their capacity as a leader to take on on this idea and make it real. I think we pretty much do the same thing at Echoing Green. So there is a lot of art and very little science in it. So it's in your belief and the passion and promise of that individual to deliver. We do think, you know, we probably focus more on the execution piece than Ashoka does because the person, when they get to Ashoka, is running their organization. The folks we're getting to have not really yet started or at the very um, beginning stages. So we're looking for signs that they can execute and deliver on what they've promised. Um, we actually are um, finishing up um, what we are calling SEQ. Um, it's a play on Daniel Goldman's EQ or emotional intelligence. We actually think there are a constellation of quality or characteristics um, that are highly correlated um, with a high degree of social change success. So these qualities, you know, it's sort of a screen, if you will. If we see them in a high degree in the folks we're investing in, we think that's a good investment. So I won't tell you all the criteria, but one, for example, is this notion of core identity formation. I talked earlier about head-heart alignment. What we see in our social entrepreneurs is they are in the zone. They have figured out their purpose and their path, and they are undeterred. They are focused like a laser on doing this work. That's the first thing. Second thing is a deep obligation to this cause. Um, it is their moment of obligation. It is the problem to which they are accountable for, and they spend most of their waking hours thinking about this problem. We also think these folks are resource magnets. These folks are particularly good at attracting human capital, financial capital, media to their causes. And I, you know, I could go on and on, but we actually sort of had this um, personality screen or this characteristic screen that we think will be helpful in identifying those social change agents that are going to be most likely to succeed uh, in their work. So that's how we like to think about it. Yeah. Yep. Well, I would say no. Uh, and again, what we like to call this model, so every year um, uh, upwards of 300 volunteers um, work with us to help us take these 1,000 plus applications and winnow them down. 
to the 15 or 20 that we'll select. And we actually have started calling it like crowdsourcing philanthropy. It's the notion of the wisdom of the crowds. So no less than eight sets of eyes will look at a business plan as it marches its way through our selection process. What I like to say is, you know, we will have, say, a, a young analyst from Goldman Sachs who will read a human rights proposal. You're right, that person knows nothing about human rights, but they do know something about the content and feasibility of a well-written business plan. So the notion that you have many different sets of eyes looking at a business plan through a particular perspective or a lens, we believe that cumulatively we get to the right answer. So you got one human rights application, you got a business analyst looking at it, you've got a human rights expert looking at it, you've got an Echoing Green alum who has started an organization looking at it, and we think through both qualitative and quantitative scoring mechanisms, at the end of the day, most of the time, we get to the right choice. There is also the notion of, you know, staff buy-in. At the end of the day, um, we have, um, you know, a heavy influence on determining who is selected. And, you know, that's where we are like VCs. I mean, I've been doing this a long time right now, and my expertise is pattern recognition. When you see enough of these, you get really good at determining which ones you think will succeed or fail. So I think we've got sort of a thoughtful process that not only allows us to get at the right answer, but it's also an inclusive process that sort of takes philanthropy out of the, the, an exclusive domain and makes it widely accessible to a lot of folks. So in some ways, I think what we do is a twofer, right? We're not only selecting these social entrepreneurs, but we're also providing a really powerful donor education experience that will help these folks, I think, go on to be better civic actors because they've seen how social entrepreneurs are doing their work. Really, at, I, that's so, it's such a great uh, question. The second one. So the first one is um, we're again a small organization, and I've got um, so I've got three senior colleagues, and the, the the four of us sort of make up the senior team. Um, two of us are Echoing Green alum. So my VP of development um, started a terrific um, uh, program here in uh, Boston, actually Boston, Cambridge, called Outdoor Explorations that works with disabled young people. Um, and it's still in, in operation. So two of us you know, come from the Echoing Green community. Uh, um, the other young woman um, came from the nonprofit sector um, and who got her start in a variety of nonprofits, youth development, youth leadership organizations. And my last colleague um, came from the for-profit sector, um, MBA, um, had no exposure to the not-for-profit sector, began as a volunteer for me um, when I started at Echoing Green eight years ago and sort of um, worked her way up the organization. Um, our younger colleagues, um, come to us mainly out of the not-for-profit sector with increasingly more folks transitioning over from the business sector. So it's a pretty, you know, a diverse mix of folks. Um, we actually have a two-tiered organizational structure um, where, you know, the senior folks stay for a long time. We're sort of the institutional memory. And a lot of the younger folks come in for a couple of years, um, sort of get the lay of the land, learn social entrepreneurs, learn about social entrepreneurship will often go off to graduate school and do other things after this experience and that sort of a system has worked fairly well for us. Um, the second question is interesting. Echoing Green um, was founded 22 years ago as a private foundation. So for the first 16 years of existence we were foundation. We got uh, our revenue from only two sources. The first I mentioned the private equity firm General Atlantic and then um, a very large U.S. Um, foundation called Atlantic Philanthropies. Um, so, you know, we were foundation. We would, you know, sort of give out money, go about our business. But then about six years ago, the gentleman who founded Atlantic Philanthropies, the duty-free gazillionaire, uh, Chuck Feeney, decided to spend down all the money in his foundation. He's like four or five billion dollars. And when we heard that, we we're like, yay, we're going to be rich, we're going to get so much money. And then we heard from Mr. Feeney that, in fact, he was going to change the giving guidelines of his foundation and he overnight essentially got out of the business of funding 
organizations like Echoing Green. So that was a critical um, inflection point for the organization because literally I was on the board of Echoing Green at that time and we sat around that board table and say, we're screwed. I mean, literally we have lost the most of our revenue. How in the world are we going to replace it? So we had very tough discussions. Are we going to shut Echoing Green down? Great run. We funded some wonderful people, but our time has come and gone. We talked about do we merge with another organization and they take on the onus of having to, you know, raise money and, and continue our legacy, or do we suck it up and learn how to become a public charity and raise money like other traditional public charities? And fortunately, the board decided that we think we had a really powerful model of social change and leadership development. Um, so it was at that time that I stepped off the board um, and became staff. And we've been, you know, raising money ever since. And so you have to figure out what your business model is. It's actually quite hard to raise uh, risk capital from foundations, just not the business of what they do, interestingly enough. They don't typically invest in individuals. They invest in organizations. So it, it's been a tricky model um, to develop and sustain. And the donor education piece is critical because today's generation of donors, and you all will be like this, no one just wants to write a check anymore. They want to be engaged philanthropists. They want to give both treasure but also time and talent to the causes they care about. So it's just turned out to be a really lovely model of um, you know, not only bringing resources to Echo and Green, but also doing great donor education for people who care about social entrepreneurship and venture philanthropy. That's a really that's a really interesting question, huh? It's a really quite. I don't think I have an answer on that. That's really fascinating, um, huh? Um, so I think it should be a part of um, educational um, curriculum. So um, I don't know. Did I send you guys the Be Bold book? Did I? I didn't send you. Oops. I should say. So a couple of years ago, my colleague and I self-published a book called Be Bold, and it's literally like a 60, 70 page, essentially career guide for those interested in social change. And all we did was take the stories of 12 of our social entrepreneurs, and I mentioned like Wendy from Teach for America, Michael Brown from City Year, and we just sort of um, told their stories as a way to introduce young people like you to social change, what it means, and potential careers. Um, and what we found in the three years since we've self-published is that I think it's close to 90 colleges and universities, ha ha they've adapted that book into classroom content and curriculum. I think that's fabulous. So I actually do think this kind of um, social change work lends itself, I think, really, you know, for younger kids to character development, values development, how are you, you know, what is your agency in the world, how do you give back, how do you make the world a better place. I actually do think for those who care about entrepreneurship and problem solving, some of these case study approaches to, so to, to studying how social entrepreneurs um, do it is, is pretty smart. So I do think the trend will be more classes like this, more case studies illustrating what social entrepreneurs are doing. I guess my hesitation is, is you know, should Echoing Green be a part of that? And my, and my thought is we shouldn't be on the front lines of it. We should be a technical support to those who are expert in doing this, but it's not our job to sort of be in the business of doing that. But I, I actually think that, you know, the notion of experiential learning, um, you know, learning from doing is pretty powerful stuff. And I bet, you know, in five years, you know, from now, you will prove prescient, and a lot of this stuff will be more and more integrated. And I, I think overall, that's a good thing. Yeah. 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 That's a good question. So. Part of it is, um, you know, as I mentioned before, change is hard for everyone, and myself included. So, you know, I didn't give the whole story. When I stepped off the board of Echoing Green, it was a pretty tenuous time. And when I stepped off the board, I literally thought it was going to be a two-month consulting gig, right? So I was like, I'll just help write the organization, and I'll go back to my life in Washington, D.C. I'll go do whatever I'm going to do next. Well, that was eight years ago. I've sort of never left. <laughs> and when I stepped off the board, my board chair said, just go figure it out, go fix it. So for the past six to seven years, that has been my job. And I'm sort of a, you know, I'm a, I'm a fixer, I like startup, I like problem solving, I like tinkering. 
I'm not so good on the institutional um, continuity part of everything. So I think succession planning for me has to, you know, you have to start to answer, you know, when should I think about moving on? When is the organization at a place where I'm no longer the best person um, to, to sort of run the ship? And when should other fresh new leadership come in? So I think that's something I got to figure out in the next couple years. Um, and, I, and I don't think people should stay anywhere forever, especially doing this kind of work, because I think fresh thinking is absolutely critical. Um, I think our board um, also, you know, culture really matters. And to get my board from being a fairly passive entity that sort of showed up quarterly, heard about what we were doing, saying, hey, great work, and they sort of go off and do whatever, that is no longer an acceptable model for Echoing Green to thrive and prosper and to um, continue to do all the great work we want to do. Um, they've got to sort of feel more comfortable in their governance and oversight role in a way that just wasn't um, necessary a couple years ago. So we're all trying to figure that out now. We're not there yet, um, but we're trying. And it's everything from, you know, I used to run all the board meetings. Now my board member, my board chair is starting to run more of the meetings. At the last meeting, they kicked me out for executive committee session. And I was like, what? You're kicking me out of the executive? But I thought, you know what? That was a good thing, you know? Because again, they're starting to take ownership of the organization that is new for us. Um, so I think, you know, it, it's bumpy, it's rocky, we'll figure it out. Um, but I think it's absolutely necessary, um, you know, for the health and well being of the organization for the board to, to really own more of it um, as opposed to just saying, oh, let the staff, they'll, they'll just go do it and they'll report out to us. So we're still in that transition period. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting, and I, I, won't, I won't call this a dirty little secret, but you pull the curtain back. You know, you would think that, um, you know, these hard-nosed, hard-edged business guys would apply the same rigor to their philanthropic investments as they do to their business investments. People in this space, they lead with their hearts, not their heads. So at the end of the day, I wish I could go in and say, I sold it, I made the case, I really hit it out of the park. They, they invest in, in me as the leader of the organization. They invest in our fellows. They invest in Echoing Green because it reminds them when they were a young entrepreneur and, oh, wasn't it great 25 years ago when I got my start? Look at what this young entrepreneur is doing. So I think people invest for emotional reasons and philanthropic work in ways that they don't in their business or professional lives. Um, so in some ways that's great because it really is all about relationships and it's not always or even most of the time about making the business case. And I will tell you, when I walk into a donor meeting, most of the time the sale has essentially, all, I mean, I have to F up really badly to not get money sometimes because, because my board member, again, it's peer to peer. So my board member gets on the phone and calls his buddy from business school and says, Cheryl's coming over to talk to you. Well, I'm 60% of the way there. I simply have to be, um, you know, credible and be articulate. And I'm probably going to get the money because it's based on relationships and people give to who they know. There's quid pro quo. Again, it, it, it's, it's, it's mushy and not precise and not scientific in a way that you would think it would be. Now, that's individual donors. Foundation donors, uh, foundations and corporations, the rationale um, is different. So foundations are sometimes a pain in the ass because each foundation... So people say, when you've met one foundation, you met one foundation. They each have a very particular view of the world, and it's your job to jump through those hoops to show that foundation how you fit into their worldview. And that's really annoying, because again, there are 60,000 foundations. So you imagine how we all have to twist and turn and all the iterations we have to go through to try to get the money from that particular foundation. So I have to say, development is a really tricky business, and which is why you often in the sector find that your development professionals are often make more than the executive director of the organization because good development professionals are so hard to find. And development is very particular to the funder. Foundation funding is different than corporate, corporate funding, um, is different than individual donor funding. So it's, it's complicated. Um, and so, you know, again, I think I close more deals because I'm passionate and committed and deeply believe in Echoing Green as opposed to probably making the case. I, I, I definitely believe 
people at the end of the day invest in the person that's sitting across the table from them. So. So we work very, I mean, it's a small field, so we're uh, very collegial. So, um, you know, uh, groups like Ashoka, New Profit, Skull, um, we very much um, serve as a pipeline for them. So again, a lot of their fo a lot of the, the, the later stage funders will look to our pipeline to get a sense of who we might want to recommend for investment. So that's been a wonderful relationship. Um, you know, for example, you know, New Profit, um, you guys know New Profit, uh, venture, they're a venture philanthropy organization based here in Boston um, that helps take social entrepreneurs to scale. They were really instrumental in driving forward um, the um, work that the Obama administration is doing around social innovation. Well, we were part of the coalition to work with them. So again, the field is small enough and we're all trying to build it together. So it's phenomenally collegial. And I would say our closest competitor is a foundation called the Draper Richards Foundation. Their business model is different than ours, but we're both in the space of being angel investors. And they're wonderful colleagues. We, sh we share deal flow. We, we share business practices. Um, and I have to say it's a lovely, you know, it's been a lovely group um, to work with. Um, and, uh, you know, I suppose over time, once the field gets bigger and more diffuse, you stop knowing everybody. But we all know each other really, really well. Um, and I would say a lot of the folks, honestly, especially the new profit folks, a lot of them came out of the Equi and Green community. So we've been friends and colleagues for a really long time. So, yeah. That's a great point. I, I, I do think we all suffer from mission creep. I mean, because again, you know, you're looking at making your payroll every couple of weeks. You, you got to keep the doors open. And often you will sort of, again, twist your, your mission um, in a way that you wouldn't necessarily do it um, to get the money in the door. And that's sort of part and parcel of the way that we do our work, um, which is, you know, one of the good trends about social entrepreneurship and this notion of earned income or for profit revenue streams is the idea that you can, with those sorts of earned income streams coming in, you don't have to worry so much about that. So I think organizations that have a more diversified funding base and rely more on fee-for-service or earned income or for-profit uh, models are less likely to suffer from mission creep. Those of us who depend wholly on philanthropic capital, it is a problem. It's a problem. And I have to say, you know, I often find um, social entrepreneurs who are incredibly courageous when they're able to walk away from the money because it is too costly. It costs too much at the end of the day when they're being veered off course from their mission. But it's really hard to do, and it's a constant struggle in our sector. It really is. Yeah, great question. So I would say two, three things I, uh, I, I've seen in the past, you know, 16, 17 years. Okay, so the first one is you guys are way smarter and savvier than my generation was. Like, I'm so thankful that I was at Green Greenfellow 15 years ago. I never would have gotten it today. I just, it was a, I couldn't compete against you all. You guys are smarter and savvier and come to the table with more tools than my generation did. It, it, it's just, that's just is just your generation. The second uh, piece is, um, you know, last year, fully 20% of our applicants um, were proposing either for-profit social enterprises or hybrid models of social change, where it was a non-profit with an earned income stream or a for-profit with a non-profit um, affiliate. That's fascinating and new. So it's the idea that you don't care how you get to change, whether it's a for-profit vehicle or a not-for-profit vehicle. You use whatever tech, you know, tax status um, you think is best to get to your goals. And I think that's wonderful. So I think that's sort of blown you know, the field wide open in terms of what business model you use. And in terms of technology, I think it has allowed people 
to organize more quickly, more robustly, and more effectively um, than just a couple years ago. Best example of that, a 2006 Echoing Green Fellow, Mark Hannes, amazing young man, started GI Net, Genocide Intervention Network, the grandson of four Holocaust survivors, um, you know, grew up in, um, where did he grow up? I think he grew up in oh, Argentina, Ecuador, um, and sort of grew up with hearing his community, his grandparents saying, never again, never again, saw what was happening in Darfur and said, okay, here we go again, the genocide, what are we going to do about it? And was a college student at Swarthmore, stopped going to classes, sat at his computer, started organizing, co I shouldn't be telling you that, sorry, uh, but, but it was great that he did it, started organizing um, college students from around the country to, to email Congress people, to show up at rallies, um, to do an amazing thing where, you know, Open Secrets um, is a website where you could see what donors have given to what political candidates, to have kids all over the country sitting at their commuters, com uh, computers figuring out which people have given to which congressman, and then they would get on the phone and call these donors and say, do you know your congressman is not supporting, you know, this bill that could help save people's lives in Darfur? You get these donors on the phone who are calling their congressman, they're moving legislation. So the ability to use technology to get um, you know, more penetrating information more quickly, to use text messaging on phones to rally 100,000 young people to flood the White House uh, with calls on a particular issue, I think has fundamentally transformed the number of people you can mobilize in a particular amount of time to, to, to have your voice heard. That's new. That, I, I didn't see that five, even five years ago. It's brand new, and it's exciting. General, yeah. thank you very much.